turn in your scripture to Exodus 14. Some of you are looking ahead in Exodus, and, uh, and I know you're very, very excited to get to the law section. Uh, it's coming, and it's going to be good, so hang tight. The passage we come to this morning, though, is really uh, a seminal passage in all of Scripture. It's a seminal passage in the history of Israel. There are moments for individuals and maybe for families oftentimes and, and for nations that uh, are so important that they define who you are. For us as the United States of America, most historians would point to the Civil War as the point in history, the event that has most shaped who we are. And if you want to know who we are as a nation, the Civil War has a lot to say about that. For Israel, it was the crossing of the Red Sea. And over and over and over again throughout the rest of their history, the Lord will, will constantly remind them of this event. Do you remember what I did for you then? Do you remember when I brought you through the sea? Do you remember when I parted the waters? Do you remember when I crushed Pharaoh's army under them? You remember that? That's who you are? That is who I am. In a very real sense, this becomes uh, the point to which the Lord would point back, direct Israel's attention to say to them, you are not a slave to fear. You have been set free. So what we're going to do this morning, rather than me read the entire chapter like we do often, I'm going to read it in chunks, and, and we'll stop and, and comment and discuss things along the way. So if you have your Bible, Exodus chapter 14, we're going to start in verse number 5. Uh, just, a, just a brief reminder, last week we saw Israel left. Egypt was like, you got to go, you got to go right now. And so Israel is, is on their way, but you can imagine getting, you know, potentially 2 million plus people mobilized, um, coming not only from the land of Goshen, but from potentially other places in Egypt. It would take some time for this to take place. And so uh, they seem to gather together and, and you know, they, they, they get organized and now they're ready to march out. But then the Lord is like, you're not going to take the quick route. You're not going to go the way of the Philistines because uh, that would run you into trouble that you're not ready for. And then he says, you know, so we're going we're gonna to go south. It's a little bit longer route. And, and then it's almost like he backtracks them. And, and I want you to go in between this Egyptian outpost and the sea. Where they were essentially trapped. And we said last week it was God uh, essentially setting the bait for Pharaoh and for the Egyptians. God desires to lure them in. He is not done getting glory over Pharaoh quite yet. So we come in verse number 5 and it says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and he took his army with him and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel with, uh, while the people of Israel were going out defiantly or with raised hands. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped by the sea, by Pihahiroth, in front of Baal-Zephon. 
Pharaoh has a moment of regret. And it's a moment that I, I think we probably have a hard time understanding. After all that Pharaoh had seen, after all that Egypt had seen, after the loss of the firstborn, and you're not done yet. You decide that letting Israel go was not the right course of action. And it wasn't just Pharaoh, it was Pharaoh and his servants. They all come to this conclusion. And it's hard to understand, isn't it? Like someone a couple of weeks ago came to me and was like, what is up with Pharaoh? How do, we, how do we explain what's going on? I wonder if, I mean, obviously there is some element here. If we don't want to lose our labor force, they, they bring that up as the reason. What, what did we just do? Like all of our slaves just left. But I wonder if there is some element of maybe a vengeful anger that stirs up in Pharaoh's heart. The man who was himself to be a god, who has been humiliated by the gods of his, the god of his servants. I imagine that didn't sit well with Pharaoh. We can't just let them walk out. And we just gave them our wealth on the way. Perhaps there is some element of that anger, that vengeance here. They should pay for the damage that their God has caused. We cannot let it be this easy. Well, ultimately standing behind all of it is the sovereignty of the Lord, isn't it? The Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. This is what he will do. And so he comes with the might of his army, the height of military technology at the time. What was for them kind of like our modern day tanks. They show up with their chariots. It says 600 chosen chariots. Probably means 600 of like the finest chariots, the finest charioteers in all the land. Plus every other chariot they could get their hand on, hands on. Would have been an intimidating army. Would have been formidable. One more than capable of mowing down a large number of untrained, unarmed slaves. Who are kind of trapped, hemmed in by the sea. And so now we have Israel in a predicament. This unconquerable army on the one side and an impassable sea on the other. Two seemingly immovable objects. And you're stuck in the middle. Now, just a word. I know the question comes up here about where exactly is this on the map? Where does this crossing take place? It calls The scripture here calls it the Red Sea. But it's been a subject of debate over the years. What, what exactly uh, does the Red Sea mean? And, and some people, there's been a lot of different options here. Okay, I'm going to give you the two maybe most popular in the last 50 to 100 years. Uh, one has been that uh, the Red Sea really means the Reed Sea. Uh, Yam Suf, because I, I know some of you love ancient languages. Uh, you expressed this to me on Thursday. Uh, so, so Yam Suf is, is the Hebrew term for what is translated in our Bible as Red Sea. The word Suf is most often translated reed. So people look at that and go, well, it must mean the reed sea. So we need to look for a body of water somewhere in the region that has a lot of reeds or grass or marshes. And, and there happens to be a, a chain of lakes above the Gulf of Suez, which is, you know, okay, geography lesson here. All right, you've got the Red Sea. The Red Sea kind of breaks off into these two finger-like gulfs. That, that outline the Sinai Peninsula. So you have the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba, okay, on either side of the peninsula. Above the Gulf of Suez, you remember the Suez Canal, right, connects that gulf all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, and there is a chain of lakes called the Bitter Lakes um, just north of that gulf. Those lakes are very marshy. They're fairly shallow. 
There are plenty of reeds. And so it's been proposed that, well, maybe that's what this means. The Sea of Reeds is actually kind of a big lake that, that's full of these reeds. Um, and the, most of the people that are, are proponents of this perspective are those that are trying to offer uh, a way to give a scientific, natural explanation for the events that we're about to look at. Well, you see, it was kind of a shallow thing. And so, you know, maybe a strong wind, and it looked like the wind was pushed back, and Israel was able to get through. Um, if that's the case, then the miracle was that God drowned the entire army in, you know, a couple feet of water. But I don't think that's the most likely op op option. Uh, I think Red Sea simply means the Red Sea. Um, Yam Suf in the scripture, every time that I could find, every time that I, I saw Yam Suf refers to the body of water called the Red Sea, or one of its two gulfs. Uh, in ancient language, and, and even in modern Hebrew, uh, there's one name given to both the sea and the gulf. So they just call it the same thing. It's viewed all together. So I think most likely, uh, the, this crossing of the Red Sea, most likely Israel is trapped right now between the Egyptian army and some location on the Gulf of Suez. Cross over Suez, you're right in the Sinai Peninsula, this part of the Red Sea. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Yam Suf was used earlier in the book of Exodus uh, when God said that he was going to bring a strong east wind and he blew all of the locusts into the Yam Suf. Uh, small lake on the north side of Egypt doesn't make sense there. right? The Red Sea makes a whole lot more sense. If he's blowing all the locusts out of all of Egypt, the Red Sea borders Egypt, uh, it just makes a lot more sense that that's what it is referring to. I think there's one other aspect, though, that is important for us to at least touch on. Because sometimes we get caught up on the where and the location and the geography, but Moses doesn't seem to be caught up on that. I think he assumes that everyone reading in his day would have, would have known what Yam Suf was. But if you're reading along in the Hebrew, Suf does take your mind back to the beginning of this book. Because it was into the reeds of the river, of the, the Nile River, that Moses' mother put baby Moses in his tiny little ark in order to spare him from the edict of Pharaoh that all of the male children of Israel should be thrown into the sea and killed. It was the Suf of the river. In other words, I think there is a subtle reminder here of how God was going to deliver his people. He was going to deliver them through a watery death. He would miraculously preserve them through the flood and bring them to freedom and blessing on the other side, just like he did with Moses. Israel's not so certain, though. Verse number 10 says, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And sometimes we can understand their response, right? I mean, you got this, this army on one hand, you got the sea on the other, and it looks like you're about to meet a potential gruesome end. I think sometimes we think, and this is a temptation oftentimes when reading some of these stories in the, New or in the Old Testament in particular, sometimes we think, man, if only God would do this, man, then I would be really confident. I would be really sure, right? But here we have yet another example where it simply doesn't work that way. Israel had just watched as the Lord decimated Egypt. 
essentially decreating the land and devastating their gods, and there was nothing Pharaoh could do to stop him. And Israel just walked out with armloads of fancy clothes and jewelry and gold and silver. They were excited. They were worshiping God. God had watched over them as they left. Now he's going with them as a giant, visible pillar of cloud and fire. So if you're in Israel at that time, you're like, where is God? Oh, right, he's with us. Right, right, right there. There's his representative. There he is. But they go from all of that to being scared senseless in the amount of time that it took them to see the chariots of Egypt and process their predicament. All of a sudden, none of that mattered. See, we think if God would only give us a certain experience, if he would only do something, then all of my doubt and all of my fear would be gone forever. And it lasts about two seconds for us. It lasts until the next predicament comes. It lasts until the next pressure point. And it starts all over again. Why? Because we look at the predicament. We look at the problem, and we fail to remember that the Lord is with his people. Israel cries out to the Lord. Same exact phrase used in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, when they cried out. But here they're directing it to the Lord. This is a good thing, right? They're crying to the right person. We'll give them props for that. But then when you keep reading, it becomes obvious that this is not them praying to the Lord in faith. This is crying out of fear and frustration and anger. Not faith. But they were crying in the right direction. Not exactly full of faith, but as we will see soon enough, God is faithful even when we are not. Their sarcasm is strong. Were there no graves in Egypt? I mean, obviously there were graves in Egypt. Anyone who might have wondered that could have just looked to the horizon. Because what are you going to see on the horizon in Egypt? Giant pyramids. What were the pyramids? Huge tombstones, essentially. They're gigantic buildings that say someone dead is here. There were plenty of graves in Egypt. Some of us are good with the sarcasm, though. <laughs> I'm not talking about like the funny kind of, you know, prodding people sarcasm. I'm talking about the kind where it seems like we're in one predicament after another. And we respond with this biting, accusatory sarcasm. That smacks more of a lack of faith than it does of humor. Verse number 12, there's really no evidence for the statement. Hey, didn't we tell you to leave us alone? Right? Didn't, didn't we tell you just to leave us here? We'd rather serve the Egyptians and go with you and die in the wilderness. There's no evidence of that statement ever having happened. I don't know whether this is revisionist history on their part or simply an unrecorded sentiment of the people that we're just not aware of. I can see this maybe fitting in the, the story where, uh, you remember when Pharaoh takes away the straw from Israel, he's like, you are idle. That's why you're asking to leave. So no more straw. Make bricks without straw. And, and the, the, the leaders of Israel come out and they find Moses and Aaron. And they're like, the Lord look on you and judge. You've made a stink in the eyes of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. I can see maybe there being a sentiment here of Moses, what are you doing? Right? Leave us alone. You're making things worse. We'd rather stay here. Whether it's revisionist history or whether this was a sentiment at some point prior to all of the plagues, how quickly they forgot. How quickly they forgot the power and the presence of God with them through those plagues. How quickly they reverted back to the fear of Pharaoh taking away their straw, the frustration. You just overlook, you bypass all of the things that God has done. Why? Because that's a big army. 
That is a dangerous army. And they are at my doorstep. And behind me is a big sea. And there's nowhere to run. Here's the truth. Looking at your predicament is a surefire way to experience fear. I mean, if you just want more fear in your life, because you don't get enough of that already, spend more time looking at the news. Spend more time reading your Facebook feed. Spend more time looking at the threats that are out there. You know, we got Putin and China and North Korea. Supreme Court nominees. Gender confusion. Spend more time looking at the predicament and you'll be afraid in no time. Why? Because they're big, they're large, and there's little to nothing that we as individuals feel like we can do about it. It didn't matter that Israel had just seen the plagues and experienced the Passover or that Egypt gave them anything they asked for on the way out and made them leave swiftly or that the Lord was right there with them as a giant pillar. When they looked at their predicament, they became afraid. I wonder this morning, what predicament makes you fear? What is it that you look at and go, man, I don't have an answer for that. But it looks bad. It feels bad. Maybe you feel like you're hemmed in, stuck between two immovable objects. You sense the threat is near. Folks, when we sing a song like, I am no longer a slave to fear, we don't just sing that for the emotional uplift it brings. We sing it because it is theologically accurate. Those whom God has set free have become his sons. His presence is ever with his people. What do we need to be afraid of? You say, man, if God were only here as a pillar of fire, then I would not fear. Really? <laughs> are we that much better than Israel? Because I don't know that we are. Look at your predicament. You will certainly become afraid. This is why Moses responds the way that he does, by the way. Moses says to the people in verse number 13, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Yahweh will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. What's Moses' response? His response is basically this. Quit looking over there and start looking over here. Right? Stop looking at the army and start looking at your God. His presence and his power makes all the difference. The answer then to our small faith, a small faith that leads to big fears, the answer to those big fears and small faith is to look at your Lord rather than your predicament. Spend more time with him than you do with the news. Spend more time thinking about him than maybe you spend trying to navigate your way out of the jam you're currently in. If God's presence and power is not the answer, then Moses' response really doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, just to come to a people in that predicament, like, hey, stop being afraid. <laughs> like, what do you mean, right? What do you mean, stop being afraid? For one, I can't just stop. And two, it's pretty scary down here at the moment. It's not a good place to be. Stand firm. You ever been so afraid that it just feels like all the strength just is just sucked out of your body? Like, like maybe something happens and, 
And, man, man, you get this fright, you get this fear, and, and maybe like this narrow escape from an accident or something in the car, and you go home and it's like, I need a nap. We're so afraid to just, you know, the, the whole, uh, you know, cartoon thing of like your, your knees knocking and, and your legs wanting to buckle, right? Anxiety does this to us, doesn't it? Man, anxiety just wears you out. We feel like we don't have any strength. We just want to stay in bed all day. Moses says, be strong. Don't let your knees buckle. Don't let your legs shake. How, Moses? How? The answer is, see the salvation of the Lord. In other words, look at him and not your predicament. Spend more time thinking of him. Spend more time with him. Spend more time knowing him than the time you give to your troubles. I think a lot of times our response to predicaments is to attack the predicament itself, right? Because those are one of the two options. Either, you know, you, you got the, flight, uh, the fight or flight kind of thing. And some of you are like, there's a third option. It's the pass out option, right? Fight, flight, pass out. I mean, sometimes we just, we just want to give all of our energy. Let me figure this thing out. I'm going, to, I'm going to regain the upper hand here. I'm going to gain control through my strength or my cunning strategy. Or like, I'm just going to run away. I'm going to find the nearest escape and I'm out of here. I'm done with this trouble. But the Lord made sure none of those things were possible. There was no way they were going to get themselves out of this predicament. They couldn't run and they couldn't fight. They were stuck. It was impossible. But God often works in the impossible, doesn't he? It's a brilliant way to remind us of our limitations, of how much we need him. How much more powerful and glorious he is than we are. Verse number 15, the Lord gives to Moses this, uh, what I always thought was kind of a harsh response. God is like, why do you cry to me? What are you doing? <laughs> and then we can read that and go, well, isn't that what they're supposed to do, right? Like, I mean, at a time of trouble, shouldn't we cry to the Lord? Like, shouldn't we pray? Now, I don't think this is fair rebuking Moses necessarily. I think this is a rebuke to Israel through Moses the prophet. He says, why are you crying to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Move forward, right? Which seems like a ridiculous thing to ask. Move forward where, right? Into what? Was he going to like wade out into the ocean? I love this though, because I think... Like a lot of us, we, we talk about these responses to fear. Sometimes that response is immobilization. Like, I can't move anywhere. And God just pairs it down. And he's like, you don't need to know anything else. Just move forward. Would you just take the next step? Just keep going? This was, in a sense, this was in a way, by the way, this is going to be surprising for some of us, this was God's way of telling his people to stop praying right now. In, in other words... Folks, there comes a time, and don't, don't just tune me out yet, okay, let me explain. There comes a time when prayer can become sinful. It's not the right option. It becomes sinful when it's time to move. If it is time to move, and you decide, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and pray over this a little more, then prayer can become a cover for our fear. It no longer is an act of faith. It is an act of delay. It is an act of trying to thwart God's plan and God's direction and God's power. It can become a cover for our fear or even our laziness. Spurgeon said of this passage, 
this verse, he said, when we have prayed over a matter to a certain degree, it then becomes sinful to tarry any longer. Our plain duty is to carry out our desires into action. And having asked God's guidance and having received divine power from on high, to go at once to our duty without any longer deliberation or delay. In other words, just do something. You prayed about it. Now move forward. This is not all that unlike the, the example we're given in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 15, when he says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, brother, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? In other words, if it's in your power to help, and your response is, Hey, I'll pray for you, brother. The guy is standing in front of you naked and starving. You know, let me put my arm around you and let's pray to God for a miracle right now. When you've got clothes and food in your cupboard, then praying has just become the wrong option. All right? Prayer isn't going to fill your brother's belly. And yes, I know God can miraculously provide through many different means, but perhaps now is not the time to pray, but now is the time to make a sandwich. Right? And maybe some of you have been hesitating. You've been praying over certain things over and over and over again. And maybe it's, maybe it's whether or not I should share the gospel with this friend or family member. And you keep praying for the perfect timing. And, oh, man, maybe it wasn't this time, right? Like, didn't work out. And you go back and you pray some more. Lord, if you really want me to share the gospel with this person, you've got to show me. And what oftentimes I think we're asking is, Lord, help this person come to me with these words, right? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then I'll know that you want me to witness to this guy, Right? And perhaps, folks, perhaps the Lord is tired of your praying in that instance. Because the answer is clear. His grace is available. And maybe it's time for action. Maybe some of us have been, maybe some of you have been halting in this decision of whether or not to even follow Christ. You've been considering and thinking about it like, should I become a Christian or not? There comes a point in time where action is needed. It's time to move forward. Our delay is merely an excuse. It's a cover for our fear. I don't know. I don't know what's on the other side. I, I'm not sure. And, and really, we're covering for fear. There's a number of things that God is going to reveal him, about himself to his people that will not only help to be an antidote, antidote to their fear, But there are things that build faith. There are things that teach us about who Yahweh is. And we're going to give our attention to those things in the last few minutes that we have, which means we've got to move fairly quickly here. Okay, number one, God has a plan. What, why does looking to the Lord help? Because the Lord has a plan. Say, so, well, I don't know what the plan is. That's okay, right? What do you say to Israel? Move forward. What would my response have been? Why? <laughs> How? Where? Lord, I need, I need like, I, I like to have a certain amount of information. You can, you can ask, you know, you can ask my parents. As a kid, I was the why kid. Right? Tell me to do something. I need the explanation, right? I need to understand. At least that's what I feel like. But the Lord gives no details to his people whatsoever. That lack of detail doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan. It just means that at the moment you don't need to know it. What you need to do is trust that there is a plan. The plan was this, verse number 16, Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may, may go through the sea on dry ground. Now listen, if the Lord had told, the, like if he comes to us and says, here's the plan, the plan is Moses is going to lift his staff and the sea is going to part and you're going to walk in the middle. How many of us would have been like, mm, like I hear your plan, I hear what you're saying, but I still have some questions. I don't like getting muddy. Well, it's going to be dry ground. Okay. Water makes me anxious. I don't know. 
Isn't there something else, God? Like, couldn't you just kill all the Egyptians and we could just go around the easy way? I'm not sure the plan would have helped. Sometimes I think God withholds his plan because it's more than we can handle. It's more than we need to know. Sometimes his mercy withholds the information. I don't know what is coming, and that's good for me. Right? All I need to know is I can move forward trusting that God has a plan, and he's not just reacting to the circumstances. He's not just making it up as he goes. It's not like us when we're playing checkers, right? It's not like we're thinking, I, maybe some of you, right? I'm not thinking two or three moves ahead. I'm like, what's good now? Let's do that. God is not reactive in that way. He's already won the game. He's already planned out all of his moves, and he knows what moves everybody else is going to make. He has a plan. As we say often, there is no plan B. Plan A never fails. He has a plan. Number two, God is faithful to those who are weak in faith. It's going to take some time for all of these Israelites to mobilize and prepare to move. So verse number 19 says, The angel of the Lord who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was a cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Israel had forgotten faith, but God was faithful to his faltering people. This angel of God, moves in this pillar of cloud to put a hedge, a barrier, between his people and Pharaoh's people. And there's a bit, like there, there's a couple things. In, in this passage, in, in the very next couple of verses, there's a couple things here that's, that if we're paying really close attention, reminds us of the creation account. You remember the very first act of God in creation? It's like I'm going to separate the light from the darkness. And what does he do here? He comes in this veil and he separates dark side from the light side. He puts a separation between his people and Pharaoh's people. And he gives darkness to the one and he gives light to the other. It is the power of the creator God coming in defense of his people. It is the God who makes a distinction between his people and his enemies. It is the God who is able to protect his people. This gives enough time then for phase two of the divine escape plan to move into action. In verse number 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and he made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. Now, living on the coast, I feel like we have a, a, something of an advantage here. Like we, we understand, maybe better than most people, the effects of the wind on the ocean, right? Like you go out, it's a windy day, there's more waves than there are on a calm day. The wind moves the water. We just had a vivid example of this with Hurricane Ian coming through. Something called a uh, uh, reverse or blowout tide, right? Where the wind, because of the way it's circulating in a hurricane and because of its location, the wind was blowing the water away from our shores. So you saw pictures and videos of people out walking around the, the docks in like Anclote and some of these places, even Tampa Bay, where all where there used to be all nothing but water, it's now land. Why? It was just the wind blowing. It sucked it out and then it pushed it into Fort Myers. We understand this, and yet there's something more dramatic at play here. There's something that goes beyond a natural explanation. God causes a wind to blow, a west wind, and it cuts a path through the middle of the sea. And the waters stack up like walls on either side. And the path has to be large enough to get this two million plus people across to the other side in a decent amount of time. Is the Lord doing something highly unusual? And yet again, there is something familiar about it all. Back in Genesis 1, verse 2, it says, The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That word spirit 
is the same exact word used in Exodus for wind. So in Genesis 1, you have the Lord gathering then the waters into one place so that the dry land appears through his spirit, a place where his soon-to-be-created people could dwell with him in safety from the water. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, It says, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to blow over the earth and the waters subsided. So there's this pattern in Genesis where the Lord delivers his people through these waters of death by creating a dry ground for them to plant their feet on. There is a new creation that God makes a space for in Adam. There is a new covenant. This this man, Noah, and his family who is delivered through the waters and God makes a space on the dry land for them. God is making a way. God is bringing about in Israel a new man, a new creation, bringing him through the waters of death on dry ground that he has formed for their rescue to bring them safely to the other side. He is faithful to those weak in faith. Three, he makes his enemies look foolish. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, where's the philosopher? Where's the scholar? Where's the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? And isn't that what we see with Pharaoh and his army? We're like, this is foolish. Verse number 23, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea. Why? <laughs> and I think we need to appreciate what's happening here. This is one of the most surprising parts, I think, of this entire story. The fiery pillar cloud moves away. Egypt sees the pathway through the sea, and in spite of all the plagues and all the death of the firstborn, in spite of the cloud, in spite of uh, the fact that they were driving chariots, by the way, which are notoriously bad in mud, they're like, you know what we should do? We should go into that thing right there. (laughs) Now, I don't know, like maybe they went down to the edge of the water and tested the ground first. I'm like, oh, this is dry. Like, this is okay. Maybe they couldn't stomach the thought that Israel could do it and they couldn't. Like, they're slaves and we have chariots. We're better, we're faster, we're stronger. Maybe they were blinded by rage. Maybe they were afraid of trying to explain to Pharaoh why they were not successful. Could you imagine that? They go back to Pharaoh and be like, "Um, so we had them. But then there was this cloud and, and, and we couldn't see too good. And when the cloud left... It was this big pathway right through the middle of the sea, and Israel was almost to the other side, so we just came home. I don't know how well that explanation would have gone over with Pharaoh. Whatever the reason, it was ultimately the Lord who drew them in. He used Israel as the bait. He made them look helpless and trapped, and Egypt took the bait. This is what it means in verse number 17 when the Lord says, I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. There is a warning here, I think, for us to remember that sin does not go down easily. Sin wants you back. It will pursue you out of blind rage. But the Lord is faithful. He will always make a way of escape. And I can't help but wonder if Paul had this pathway through the sea in mind, this seminal moment in Israel's history in mind when he penned those words. God will cut a path through the sea in order for you to escape temptation. On the other hand, there are so many warnings through this story against hardening your heart against the Lord. Folks, that is not a fight that you can win. The warning and the encouragement is to humble yourself. The Lord fights for us. Verse 24, In the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. I don't know what this looked like. I've always said from a child, like I wanted to know, like what does this look like that he looked down on them? I kind of have in my mind, I think it was one of the, 
I think it might have been like the mummy movie or something like that where the dust storm is coming and you see the face of the mummy like in the, uh, like I think as a kid I had something like that in mind. I'm not so sure that this is what this is, but it's fun to think about. Whatever it is, the Egyptians were terrified. And I don't know whether God allowed the water to start to bubble up from the ground to, to soften the soil again so the chariot wheels started to get clogged in the mud or whether he just pressed the wheels into the ground himself and caused some of them to come off. Whatever it was, Egypt is now in a panic. They are in the middle of the ocean with walls of water on either side and they are stuck. It's that moment of impending doom settles in to this once powerful army. The conclusion that the Egyptians reach is a theologically correct one. Yahweh fights for his people. Man, sometimes it's like the world gets it better than we get it, right? Like they're looking around going, like, we don't have an explanation for that. They got something going on there that we can't quite fully explain. Man, do you believe that? Do you believe that God fights for you? Will you believe it if your political party loses ground in this election cycle? Will you believe it if you lose your job tomorrow? Will you believe it if you're given bad medical news? Or if you're attacked and lose friends over your biblical convictions? Man, it just makes our heart cry. Man, I Oh, that the church would believe today that it is the Lord who fights for us and not our politicians. It is the Lord who fights for us so we do not have to win by expanding our political influence or even by protecting our religious freedoms. Listen, we want all of those things, but I am concerned that too many in the church today are fearful and angry and lashing out at their pastors and at each other because they do not really believe that it is the Lord who fights for us. For his people. The Lord ultimately destroys his enemies and delivers his people. Verse 26 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the, of the host of Pharaoh that followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. What a way to end this. Israel afraid because they saw the Egyptians. And now they see the Egyptians again as dead bodies on the beach. Why? God delivers his people. And God destroys his enemies. So in our fear and in our predicament, what do we do? We look to the Lord. We trust in him. This is ultimately the conclusion that Israel comes to. Verse 31, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. You might ask the question, well, how much faith do I need? It's a question that's kind of typical of our day because we treat faith like a commodity, but the answer is very simple. You need just enough faith to step onto the path. Just enough faith to step onto the path and walk forward. Hebrews 11.29, the author of Hebrews, says that's exactly what Israel did. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. It wasn't because their faith parted the sea. It wasn't because their faith moved the hand of God to part the sea. It was because God parted it, and I need an amount of faith to step into it. I need faith to move forward, to trust God that this is the path, that this is my deliverance. I think one of the greatest evidences that this is faith, by the way, is that Israel didn't trample each other on the path. Can you imagine two million people, like, threatened? We're all going to die. Path opens up, and God's like, go. I can see in modern days, like, this is, 
it's just a free for all, just elbowing people and knocking people over, trampling little kids. Like we're just we're out of here. They move forward in faith. What does this path look like for us? Folks, the reality is Christ, God's plan, is now what it was then. This has been our underlying point through the entire book of Exodus. Say, what do you mean? Well, we just read in John chapter 19 that Jesus was handed over to be crucified. It is a moment of vulnerability. It is a moment when it appeared that the Father had abandoned him for good as the sky grows dark and Satan is lured in for the kill. The trap had been set. Evil appeared to have won. But then the trap was sprung. The very walls of death itself collapsed as the body of Jesus again drew breath. So Colossians 2.15 says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Jesus. Just as the Lord lured in the Egyptians through the weakness and seeming vulnerability of Israel in order to get glory through their destruction, so he does with Satan, which means that now the sinner must pass through Christ in order to escape from death to like life. He is the way. He is the path of safety on which we must cross by faith if we are to be saved. For all Israel's fear and doubt, it was faith that put them on the path across the sea. And for all of our sin and guilt and shame and doubt and fear. It is faith that causes us to look to Christ and to see him as the way, the path, the one who has opened the door to life and freedom, the new and living way into the presence of God. 1 Corinthians 10 says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that the, all fa our fathers were un all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, passing through the sea was a picture of baptism for them. It demonstrated their faith and their, their oneness with Moses. It pictured their leaving behind sin as they moved forward toward the fearful, holy mountain of God. It was a picture of new life. And so we, who put our faith in Christ, we have died with him in his death, and we are raised again to newness of life. Folks, the answer at every turn, whether the predicament is our sin, whether the predicament is future judgment, whether the predicament is something I face in this life that troubles me, the solution is the same. Look at the Lord. Look to Christ and see his salvation. Let's pray together. Lord, our hearts are full of gratitude for the salvation that you have brought for your people. Many of us here this morning have experienced that salvation. Many of us have experienced what it is to be set free from sin, to be freed from our guilt, to no longer be slaves to fear. Yet we are all tempted by our predicament. We are all tempted in our weakness to look at the very thing that would create, that would stir fear in our hearts. And we find it so easy to turn our eyes away from you. Would you help us now? Help us to see you more clearly. Help us to know you more intimately. And help us to trust you more deeply. Father, for those who might not know Christ, 
those who may have not experienced such salvation. Lord, I pray that for them today would be the day of action. Today would be the day of moving forward into Christ. I pray that you would set aside fear. And I pray that you would give faith in its place. Lord, cause us to be a faithful people, bold, active, prayerful people. We pray these things in Jesus' name.